Many people have problems with art and not with reality. So why is art different? It's pretty simple, right? This is knowledge, this is thinking, this is thought. Yeah, it does something strange with your head. Welcome to the Undergang Armchair. Bring it. Welcome to the Undergang Armchair. My name is Ando. Happy 2016, everybody. So an interesting thing about being an adult in this crazy world is that at a certain point, you realize that you cannot do it all. It just happens to everybody. That is, unless you're Michael Bo, he really clarified some things about the upper echelons of arts administration. Uh, I really thought that the system favored the pencil pusher type, the businessman, the dour high school principal, and their role was mostly just to slap reality into the face of artist types and, you know, scream we can't afford it at everybody. Boy, was I wrong. At least when it comes to Mikkel. Like everything, and I think I'm starting to mean everything, passion leads the charge here. So, don't get me wrong, you need a tightrope walker, somebody who understands money, people, power systems, the whole deal. But it does not mean that you need someone from the outside with no passion or interest in the art world. The longer I'm part of this show, the more I see that it's passion that differentiates between mediocrity and excellence. If you want to do anything well, and I'm pretty sure it's anything, just make sure you love it. So that's my goal for 2016. We're going to get right to it here. I just want to say Happy New Year's to everybody. Thank you for your patience while I've been out tiptoeing in the world. We're coming back hard with this great talk with Mikkel, which was so good, and he was so patient with his time that we cut it into two episodes. So part one you are getting right now, and part two is coming down the pipeline already next week. Then we'll have a third episode at the end of the month just to make it up to you guys for your patience. Isn't hitting the ground running what the new year is all about? Yes, so welcome back, everybody. It's going to be great. And enjoy part one of my talk with Michael Bow. I mean, that's the thing, you send so much energy on doing it mm. that you forget to you know get the word out yeah and there's so much uh, attention required now for everything yes you know everyone is being yelled at from all directions i know i know look at me look at me look yeah, at me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. so but you know for the first time in my professional life i have people to do this oh, that's uh, and they are they are so uh, skilled and so inventive one day i'm uh, gonna have that yeah <laughs> yeah i mean because that's the thing you do it all yourself and mm. then it becomes it becomes confusing uh where's i had notes here uh but it's true there's just so much you know you guys are doing a good job louisiana is doing a good job you can you can see the people who are making an effort mm. to be visible yes on the on the on the you know cultural spectrum or whatever the hell yes. you want to call it mm. you want to think that like well if this is a good enough space people will come on their own mm. but i don't think they will no you know and that's what that like we were talking about earlier that mm. audience development is yes. all about yeah uh the uh making sure people know about it yes i think also it fits into a little bit of a weird middle area in that it's in english but it's primarily about danish art mm. world yeah uh people so i think not all danes want to listen to a show in english even though everybody well, speaks perfect english here well yes uh, they're better than Finnish people used to be. Actually, I had a meeting with a Finnish person today, and uh, it's it suddenly struck me that uh, wow, you uh, you are able to speak English now. You, it's it was a problem uh, ten or fifteen years ago. Well, it was a whole generation but, too. Yeah, it's a, it's a generational thing. Yeah, um, absolutely. But uh, no, you you might be it, uh, you might be right that uh, that that many Danes would refrain from listening to a one hour podcast in English. If uh, but uh, yeah. It's, it all depends. It all depends. Yeah. If you're sufficiently interested, I think you will do it. Well, let's be honest, too. I started without having any idea what I was doing. 
Mm. So I don't think the first 40 or 50 episodes are particularly good. You know, mm. you learn by uh, yeah. doing it. Uh, absolutely. Which, you know, I guess is how everybody starts. That's probably how you started, too. You were just interested in art at some point. I hadn't got a clue about what to uh, what to do with it, uh, with that interest. It yeah. started with a fascination, with an interest, with a deep kind of uh, a feeling that that this had an attraction, and it w- this was a door opening into history and into other worlds, people's minds, uh, people's uh, the structure of people's feelings, uh, things like that. But uh, but whether I was going to be in research museum, uh, whatever, I, I hadn't got a clue, and I didn't. I didn't actually consider uh, career perspectives uh, in in the first years, but then eventually you have to to decide. Yeah. Well, I think that's kind of how it goes. The excitement comes first, mm. and then the reality comes mm. later. Yeah. <laughs> did uh, Did you ever consider being an artist? No, actually not. Or uh, wait a minute. Ah. Maybe I did. <laughs> Maybe I did, but not a visual artist. Okay. I, co- I consider it becoming a music- musician. Mm. I spent a lot of my time in my youth uh, playing the guitar, playing saxophone. I played in big bands. I played in small uh, bands. I played solo. I pa- played with other guitarists. Mm. Uh, I practiced a lot. Uh, so uh, music and the feeling of creating uh, things with my hands, uh, I think, was... Uh, was uh, partly where it started for me, mm. uh, and uh, but it also started uh, in uh, in geology. Hmm. Uh, my interest uh, as a very young nerd uh, in uh, in geology and uh, and natural science uh, partly sparked by by uh, by a good friend of mine who was uh, really talented, uh, which you couldn't say about me in uh, mathematics and uh, all things. Uh, uh, in all things regarding natural sciences, he and his uh, his father, who was a, f- a physician, uh, kind of dragged me into the world of natural science, and uh, and I was so inspired by this whole this this scientific attitude, uh, the way of doing research, of turning every stone and looking to what's uh, behind uh, appearances and th- so on, and to to. Um, make a kind of uh, recent systematic uh, uh, um, uh, interrogation or research into an area that's uh, that combined with a creative uh, kind of um, uh, the creative part in of my DNA mm. uh, would develop into uh, well art history. I'm slowly learning how creative research is. Mm. Uh, I am late to the party that figured out that. You know, when you make art or you're a working artist, research is just as important as the actual making or can be. Yes. And uh, research is tough. Mm. It is not an easy thing. I mean, even now, with more information at our fingertips than we've ever had before, mm. it's, um, you know, even just what you choose, if you're looking through a list of things, what you pull out of that is so subjective and so much based off of what, you know, your own personal experience, what you're looking for, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. I totally agree. But did you, when you, I mean, why didn't you study musicology then or music history? Or? I, I consider it musicology or music, uh, music science, as it's called at the University of Copenhagen. But, uh, but then I was, um, uh, I don't know. I, I I didn't even submit my application. Uh, some somewhere during high school, I was I, I couldn't say I was fed up with music because that wasn't at all the case. But but I felt that um, um, envisaging or uh, um, seeing a career as a music teacher, uh, basically a school teacher uh, teaching music, uh, which was the most likely uh, career perspective back then at least uh, didn't really attract me so uh it's kind of uh, grim uh yeah pretty grim i hate to say it but yeah. <laughs> it kind of is uh i'm sure a lot of people do it every day and they and they love it yeah. and uh and uh, and they do a, a great job it just wasn't something for me mm. back then um and also um uh, gradually uh, i became more interested in in history proper and that came in the third uh, 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 in the third year of of high school. 
uh, I began reading history books uh, apart from what I was uh, um, told to read by the mm -hmm. history teachers. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I was a little bit split or torn between my uh, year-old uh, uh, interest in natural sciences and history. And for some odd reason, I, I decided on medical studies Uh, for me back then, uh, yeah, you're laughing. It, it goes is, uh, in a lot of different directions. Yeah, a lot of different directions. Yeah, <laughs> I saw a lot of open roads, you know, and I I I chose what uh, uh, what to me back then uh, appeared as the um, uh, the pragmatic middle road. Medical mm -hmm. science is, is uh, uh, opens a lot of uh, vistas and doors into different areas that could be more anthropological. It could be. It could be Uh, uh, psychiatry, social sciences, even, and uh, on the other side, it could be uh, clinical work uh, uh, and more scientific research. Uh, so, so it it was a really, uh, I think, a way of postponing uh, the difficult decision. Uh, and um, only, after only half a year, uh, I found myself reading uh, history books again. Right, uh, and. Um, So I dropped out of medical studies, uh, went to, to France to learn some French. Uh, I don't know really why. I, I, I guess I had a girlfriend who was good at French, and, uh, and I thought it was a good idea to, to, uh, to you, match her. You had to. I had to, yeah. yes. So uh, on my way to, um, to, um, to France, I, uh, I stopped over in Amsterdam where, uh, to, to meet a friend. I had, uh, uh, I'd come to learn in Nepal uh, some years before when I was uh, walking in the Himalayas. Wow. And uh, and we smoked a lot of pot. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then when I when I wasn't uh, totally uh, you know uh, uh, under the uh, uh, impression of <laughs> of of that inspiration, I went to the Rice Museum. Uh, and uh, in the Reich Museum, I saw these strange, strange images. I'd never actually, maybe I'd seen them before, but uh, but I saw them there really for the first time. Uh, these um, uh, nature mort, st still lives, mm -hmm. uh, still lives, fruits uh, being presented on tables and uh, or in uh, window frames, uh, watches, um, uh, kitchenware, things like that. They were so strange, so mysterious, and so attractive. Uh, this whole 17th century Dutch uh, uh, bourgeois universe. Mm -hmm. That uh, when I finally came to uh, to uh, Paris or to Dijon, where I, s I studied for half a year uh, in a kind of preparatory uh, language school, I uh, I borrowed from the library a lot of books on art history and 17th century Dutch art and uh, I didn't even know that the art history was an option at university so I, I wrote a letter back to my parents asking if they could look into this area art history if that was something you could study in Copenhagen and uh, they told me oh yes there is an old uh, uh, that was a whole program there. the whole thing yeah that's <laughs> so I submitted uh, my application and uh, and I began in 85 uh, at the rather late in life you would say I was 22 uh, that's a good age though Yeah, I mean, yeah. I find that a lot of the like people who found an interest in something, whether it's being an artist, whether it's um, being a researcher, a scientist, mm. there's some sort of like event that happens. So in the mythology of you, the event's probably going to the museum mm. and 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 feeling the artwork for the first time. Yeah. And you know, it's the same for me. I saw a, a Bill Viola show in San Francisco at the age of 18, I guess. Mm. And that was the one where I just kept being like, I can't believe someone can do this, that this is real. Like someone actually put effort into this. Mm. And, uh, and so, you know, I think you have to wait around for that to happen in a way before you really can focus. Because otherwise you're just studying something like imagine if you'd stayed with medical history just because you had to, you know, you did that to delay mm. that inspiration. Yes. And thank God you did. And I think that's the truth for a lot of young artists or young people just looking for something in life. You just got to go out there. And if you need to go to France, go to France. Mm. If you need to go walk the Himalayas, go walk the Himalayas. As long as you have the freedom to do that, yes. you'll probably find whatever it is you're looking for, even if you don't know what that is. But did you then, I mean, so you just did the education. I saw you were a professor for 10 years or so. Yeah, I was a um, uh, associate professor at University of Copenhagen. I I started uh, my PhD program, uh, my PhD studies at the University of Copenhagen. Then I went to Aarhus University for mm -hmm. a year and got a job uh, at tenure in uh, in Copenhagen. Uh, 
uh, again. So, um, so I started there and I spent um, 10 years uh, at the University of Copenhagen. In, in a, actually, in, uh, not in an art history department, but in a, in a department for comparative literature. Oh, okay. uh, they had a, a master's program in modern culture studies. It's still there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was the kind of art history guy in the in the modern culture studies program. Just there to fuck everything up for the uh, other people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I did actually, or maybe we all did. <laughs> well, I mean, what did you learn from teaching? What did that teach you? Oh, I learned a lot uh, from students, from my uh, colleagues at university. Uh, it was actually it was uphill in the beginning, uh, maybe because I I was uh, I had. Uh, uh, you know, barely ended my, my art history studies before I began teaching broad topics like cultural theory, uh, 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 the cultural history of uh, 20th century, things that I was actually not too familiar with. That's heavy. Yeah. To stand there all heavy. of a sudden, you're the responsible person. Oh, you know, the, um, uh, the, the program was so big and there was so much reading and we had small kids back home. And uh, so I remember myself being up three o'clock in the morning, reading, reading. So I was just, you know, being uh, uh, only a step forward compared to the right. students. And, uh, but, uh, but I learned a lot, but not only in terms of uh, uh, professional stuff and knowledge, What I learned was uh, was the way you. Um, I learned about developing knowledge in company with other people, mm. and actually, in the beginning, I was uh, 30 years uh, old when I began uh, uh, teaching at university level, um, and some of the students were maybe in their early 20s. So actually, we were about the same age. I felt. Mm -hmm. um, I felt pretty young, and they felt that I was young too. I think, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but I learned about how you can, uh, what you can do in a community. And in the, the during the first years, I think I, I I tended to teach in a very kind of professorial way, like giving lectures to the students who were then listening and uh, writing down in their small uh, like Chinese. Like I had learned, probably. Like I had learned, and they were taking notes in their Chinese notebooks and uh, things like that. But then gradually I became more aware of the teaching situation as a, as a, um, or the class as a kind of community thing where, where you exchange ideas. And, uh, it, it, it was a tough learn, I think. And, uh, but, uh, but I became better at it. And, uh, and the, um, uh, finally, uh, my, my last teaching, uh, not to say that I will never teach again because I probably will. I love teaching, mm. but, uh, But uh, after university, I spent nine years at the uh, Academy of Fine Arts in Copenhagen. I served as a dean or as a rector, as mm -hmm, we call it, mm -hmm. in Denmark. And um, I, I had the opportunity to teach also, not much, but I did it regularly. Okay. And uh, teaching art students is, is totally different or, or partly different from teaching Uh, academic, young academics. Yeah, they don't listen, the art students. <laughs> <laughs> they listen, but they listen with other ears. <laughs> and they are not listening with a view to a curriculum and uh, to a fixed curriculum and an examination, right. a final examination. The students in an art academy, they listen with a view to the studio work that they're right. doing late in the afternoon. So they listen to me talking about Walter Benjamin or Gilles Deleuze and uh, the Rizome or whatever. Uh, things that would interest them, and then they they go back making paintings or installations or sound art, right. and uh, so so what's happening in their heads and how they translate this knowledge and make it work in in spatial in uh, in in coloristic in the, in whatever terms material terms is really really mysterious and and uh, extremely interesting. That's, uh... So so there I learned another thing about the translation work that takes place in students' minds and, um, and how, and I think actually uh, also we can come back to that, but that, that's, that's also a thing for me now working in a museum, that when you present things, when you display works, when you, when you mediate what, whatever it is in a museum, you have an audience um, uh, coming uh, not just as people receiving whatever message you have envisaged uh, and planned for them but who are translating who are juggling with struggling with and uh, and uh, dealing with this information and reconfiguring it in in unforeseeable ways 
Well, that's the thing about that kind of thing. It's like, it's like there's, you know, my wife, she's in academia and she complains that it's always like, what do we have to write? What do we have to know? What do we have to do to mm. get past this? Yes. To, to, yeah. to pass the class. To yes. Go on and then you become a teacher and then you have to write papers every once in a while. You have to, you know, it's all so regimented and like, yes. okay, it, it, it comes away from the idea of studying knowledge for knowledge's sake. And I suppose that art school probably has more of an advantage that you just use that information however you want or you don't. Yes. There is a sense in which... Um, Art, art academy students are more free to just enjoy the uh, the knowledge uh, uh, development for its own sake, mm. uh, or at least I would say uh, they they enjoy it as a kind of uh, as something that sparks uh, inspiration. Uh, and um, whereas in a, in a university, and it this was actually a development I experienced coming. Gradually, during the ten years I spent there at university, um, that that uh, that knowledge was to a growing degree um, uh, fixed into these curricular um, uh, frameworks. Uh, this is the way you have to understand it. This is the way you make a presentation. This is the way you present it in an ex- examination, uh, uh, and so on. And um, it's problematic. Uh, I think it's problematic. Of course, there is in in all kinds of uh, uh, professional areas, and uh, uh, and not only in in higher education, there is some kind of basic knowledge. You simply need to. I mean, if you want to learn grammar, you need to understand the structure and be able to account for it. If you want to learn uh, whatever it is uh, to be a mason, you've got to know how to do things that masons do and so on and that that goes without saying but what what we want to do is not just having these um these kind of uh standardized uh, candidates who all know the th- same things uh, in the same ways right we want individuals we yeah. want them to be creative to uh to use uh, this basic knowledge their own way and to be uh, to be to make themselves uh, uh um to make themselves into into creative citizens mm-hmm. uh, who can also, of course, contribute to the job market and to develop uh, our society and all that, and uh, and and the standardization uh, of knowledge that uh, that uh, that takes place these years, I think, is a little bit scary. How does that relate to your life as the dean of the school? I mean, you got farther away from teaching and more into administration in mm. that period. Yes, and th- what what's that? balance like for you uh on a on a uh, professional level on a pure like job level or task level because there is also a personal level there but i'll come back to that on a on a uh on a pure task or professional level i would say that i i was dragged into or i was attracted (laughs) partly dragged partly attracted (laughs) into administration administration is part of every university academics work sure and uh some hate it most uh, academics hate it uh it's a kind of a necessary evil uh i i happen to be quite uh fond of it and so i i began uh, for me it began uh, with uh, in in close collaboration with a colleague uh, at the university uh, there, who is still a professor there, uh, making uh, or setting up a, a doctoral school school for PhD mm. PhD program, mm-hmm. and there I found out that uh, that one thing is uh, is uh, writing, researching, and uh, teaching. Another thing, and and just as interesting uh, and equally important thing, is setting up the framework. Uh, uh, for for uh, academics, uh, so that they can develop students uh, and uh, colleagues alike. Mm-hmm. So uh, I found out that there was. Um, I just found myself enjoying uh, making making the framework, developing the the uh, the facilities, the uh, the um, the atmosphere, and all the leadership it took to uh, to make people people not just feel comfortable in this kind of cozy way but feel inspired and uh, and make them you know uh, do their utmost right. uh, and and make people meet and things like that so so um uh, leadership for me is uh, and leadership in higher education for me is about uh um uh, making room for students uh, but also making sure that students get the knowledge that is necessary for them to be 
uh, attractive uh, on whatever job market they are they are entering after after studies. So of course it's 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 uh, that's I, the balance. That's the balance is to do it in a kind of responsible way, mm. but being responsible as a dean or as a, a head of department because I also served as a head of my own uh, department uh, at the university the last three years I spent there is is about. Uh, uh, Giving the um, uh, living up to the uh, or uh, feed the uh, the job market with the with the competences that is needed, but also to in a way surpass or or um, surprise uh, the job market, so that you can deliver competences in in the form of students that uh, uh, that are um, uh, new, fresh. Innovative, mm -hmm. all that I think uh, is is what uh, uh, university management is about. Yeah. Uh, not just sticking to the rules and making sure that the students know things in fixed way, but that they can they can use it interestingly and uh, and in a personal way. So developing their subjectivities uh, is uh, is what I was really really keen on doing, and and this is even more pressing uh, and. Uh, Uh, also, uh, really a challenge in an art school, where especially in a European uh, Beaux Arts Academy system, uh, which is not as university. Um, uh, it's as you probably know, uh, um, uh, art art schools in most European countries are not affiliated or not part of uh, universities. They are independent. Okay. Uh, and the same uh, 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 is uh, is the case with the. Academy of Fine Arts in Copenhagen is reporting directly to the Ministry of Culture. Mm. So it's not part of any larger university institution. So it has nothing to do with KU, for example? No, or nothing. Or Aarhus University or anything? Nothing whatsoever. Uh, it's on the same level uh, in, t in terms of graduation, uh, uh, but, but, uh, but it's, it's an independent uh, study program uh, in a way, reporting to the cultural ministry, whereas the university is reporting to the Ministry of Of research and education. What is the role of the Ministry of Culture? You know, what are they whispering in your ear as the dean of the school? Uh, well, they, I, I, I heard many voices during the nine years I spent there, and in the beginning, it was mostly about uh, keep the institution running mm -hmm. uh, and uh, make ends meet meet financially. Right. right. Um, but um, but then came a new voice um, that said uh, Bologna, the Bologna Agreement, uh, do the same as universities, make the art academy look like a university study program with a, a curricular program uh, and so on, and transforming an, um, in a certain way, old-fashioned, open, very, in a way also very anarchic uh, and very free kind of education, a bizarre education. Uh, into a university curriculum-based uh, um, study program uh, or university program is really, really hard without uh, throwing the baby away with the bathtub. Mm -hmm. um, the baby here is the freedom enjoyed by the individual students to follow his or her own path. Uh, uh, and um, the bathtub, the, one, uh, the things you want to throw away is the more um, uh, um, uh, is a kind of the most rigid part of the old academy model where right. you have professors uh, sitting on top and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, not that there's anything wrong with professors and I had really spectacular uh, professors in the academy but but we had a system where the students were in a way very dependent on the professor also on the on the, the personal the, uh, the taste of the professor the personal relationship and so on whereas in a university program you are in a way because it's uh, it's Uh, it's more, it's more fixed and it's more defined what you should do and the way you should do it. You're also more independent in in uh, in relation to your to your teachers. So so there are uh, there are uh, you know pros and cons, but but uh, but uh, avoiding throwing away the the baby that is uh, uh, the um, the open program where the student can choose his or her. Uh, uh, path through the program and uh, and uh, even choose his or her own curriculum right uh, uh, and to do that within the the Bologna model which is the basically the the name of the the uh, the uh, the standard the European standard university program is this was a really tough system 
Partly. The, Partly. The, 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 the Bologna system, is this a grading system for like, or a systemization of yes. character? Yeah, and that sort of stuff? yeah it's, it's that as well. But it's, it's what it basically is, uh, is a, a, a generic uh, definition of uh, competences achieved at different levels. Uh. So in order to achieve a, um, a BA uh, a grade, Uh, you you need to know this and that within your right. and professional you area. In France, Portugal, or Denmark, you should have the same education. The same, so that uh, as a B, as a BA uh, or BFA, as it's called in the mm -hmm. visual arts in 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 Lisbon, you should uh, that that should be acknowledged as a BFA in Denmark as well, and vice versa, mm -hmm. it's because we know that it's it's a uh, it's a program that's designed within the same general generic system. Mm -hmm. And what was the Beaux Arts uh, system before? That was the more free one. Uh, the Beaux Arts system was the uh, was the academy system, basically uh, founded in the uh, uh, by the, the French Academy in the 17th in the okay. mid 17th century, where you have professors um, uh, uh, professors uh, residing uh, in the uh, in the institution in life lifelong. Uh, um, uh, um, lifelong jobs right. and uh, uh, teaching students as their own assistants or pupils. So it's a kind of master apprentice system. Right. Gilded almost. Yeah. Yes. Almost like, yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, they both sound, uh, you know, fucked up and they both sound, yeah. you know, good. Too. It, it, it's we, hard to reconcile. It's hard to reconcile. Uh, we, we, uh, we used to say at, the, at my academy, me and my professors and teachers, that we wanted to take the best from both, both models. Uh, and that's what we try to do. I, I wouldn't say that we uh, achieved uh, anything like an ideal academy, but but we we worked on it. Well, it's damn near impossible, I would say. I mean, it, it goes back to the philosophy of education and the problems mm. with that, and you know, yeah, on and on. Yeah. But was it then a pleasure to jump over to uh, to the state's art museum? Let me put it this way: it was a great pleasure to uh, to be uh, for me to be. Uh, 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 in and or to serve as a, a dean as a rector uh, at the academy it was also a great pleasure to leave it mm -hmm. after nine years i felt that uh, i could of course easily have taken a couple of more years but that would probably have been it yeah been it i uh i was uh, without being drained uh or uh, tired uh of it i was i felt that uh there was a next move a next step for the academy and uh and it was the right time for a new one uh mm -hmm. to to take that Well, they got a good one too. Yeah, they got Sam a good one. Great. Absolutely, it was a perfect choice, in my opinion. She was uh, really uh, uh, the the right one to mm -hmm. to take it uh, further. Unfortunately, uh, um, but that goes for all of us. Uh, uh, she also had to uh, in this transformation process to uh, to cut back to to make budget cutbacks and uh, transforming and developing an institution while cutting back. Is, is really an art in itself. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what's happening right now. There are cutbacks across culture everywhere, mm. all, yeah. all across yeah. the country, and it doesn't look like it's going to get better anytime soon either. No, no. Um, And, you know, you have to deal with this as well in your new mm. job. Yeah. <laughs> but what was it like? But, I just, yeah, no, go yeah, ahead. No, no, so, but just because you were, you were asking what, what, uh, what was in it or what, uh, how, in which way was this a, a challenge? And I, I was... Saying this jump from a cat from a university to academy, and I would say in a in a more uh, uh, on a more personal level, um, this uh, this this meant uh, this meant a lot to me because it it was uh, for me it 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 meant getting going from the university typical university cultural studies program to a, a, an art academy was getting closer to the uh, the production phase uh, and the the fragile moments of developing talent or developing uh, artistic sensibility and that was uh, uh, that was really really uh, uh, inspirational to to be so close to that and and to to make sure that and that's that's uh, that has been a kind of a personal a constant personal pleasure for me to to make sure that you have a program and institution which is uh, in a way a contradiction in terms or paradox you have an institutional framework and this one 250 years old institutional framework for developing what is basically a transgressive praxis uh, and uh, and for some of the students even an anti-institutional practice and how can you 
how can you frame, how can you institutionally frame such a practice? Uh, developing it and uh, so you have to be present and to press and to also make sure that the students have a certain knowledge level and uh, and uh, and that they they are you know on a par with or they can be uh, benchmarks with the best students from other academies and art schools all, all over the world mm. while at the same time keeping it open and very individual and uh, in, a, in a way much more subjective mm -hmm. in its approach than the mm -hmm. university study program. That's really, really a challenge, an extremely interesting and stimulating one. Has there ever been any interest in letting more students in per year? You know, uh, you mean if uh, if the uh, the state or the uh, cultural ministry from anywhere? Um, I mean, because it's just one of the things that struck me when I moved here is there's only about thirty students let in per year, right? Uh, even less, twenty five, twenty five, twenty five. So I it's a needle's eye. Yeah, and I went through. I went to a school that had, you know, I don't know, uh, eight hundred to fifteen hundred students, and that mm. was really selective too. Yes, yes. Granted, America is a much bigger country percentage wise. Mm. Maybe it's somewhat similar, but it just meant there was more of us. There was more yep. classes. There was more or everything yeah and it seems very small somehow i think um uh the cultural ministry and the and also the the academy as an uh institution uh wants the program to stay uh exclusive not meant and uh, not in the sense that that uh, it wants to exclude a lot of uh, a lot of uh, talent even though that's the uh, that's de facto uh, the way it is yep. but but exclusive in the sense that that this should be a uh, uh, a kind of a six year masterclass where where the most uh, talented or the most um, uh, yeah talented slash inspired slash uh, interesting young Creative people can develop uh, whatever they, uh, whatever project they envisage, uh, or they they have inside themselves uh, under the under uh, almost ideal circumstances. So turning it into a mass program, I'm not saying that the San Francisco program is a mass study program because obviously it, it's not at least compared to. Some Chinese schools that I visited, where they have thirty thousand students in as an a, art school in an art school, wow. art and design school. So this is really a big scale. Yeah. So compared to that, the San Francisco and all other American art schools are really small. Yeah. But uh, but still, um, uh, the, um, the the exclusivity is about uh, 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 maintaining a high level and a very close connection between a teacher and and uh, and and a student. And also uh, making sure that you have a, a community of students that that's quite uh, um, intimate in a way. Yeah. So the intimacy and the and the um, and the uh, and the all the exchanges that makes uh, that that opens for is is part of the idea. Um, so actually, it, it has never been considered in my time mm. letting in more students. Mm. Uh, that would be a, a totally different kind of. Of program, right? And uh, so, so even if it's from from a uh, from an American pers perspective or a British uh, UK perspective, it's a very small uh, uh, art school. It's it's actually the the biggest one in uh, Scandinavia. Uh, so wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I mean, if sense. you go to Malmo, for example, they they let in twelve students per year. Wow. So. Um, that makes for a certain thing. And it's also yeah. reflected in the art scene here in that mm. it's an intimate art scene. Yes, it is so an intimate art people scene. People know each other. People yeah. know yeah. Them, yeah. And also I think it's it's a consideration. You can uh, you can disagree on that. And I, I, I would say I, I have my doubts. Uh, but uh, but anyway, uh, it has been a consideration that, uh, that letting in more students or letting out, uh, 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 generating more uh, fine arts candidates would be a problem for the for the art market or the art, not the art market in the commercial sense, but for the kind of job creative job market for right. uh, creatively trained uh, people, young people. Uh, it's uh, um, uh, politicians and uh, and civil servants uh, believe that the uh, that the that the market simply wouldn't be able to absorb. Uh, a it would, and then it would look more like a British or American system where yeah. ninety nine out of a hundred people get nowhere. Get nowhere or are being absorbed in other systems, yeah. which is not uninteresting. I mean, there are. Uh, I heard the other day or the other year that seventeen thousand art students educated in, in the UK every year, and uh, 
I can I can tell you that they are not becoming artists in the classical sense. All of them. They're not making Probably, a living in that sense. They are not making a living. But some artist. of them, uh, you know, uh, uh, get a job in the city in city and London, and uh, and others take a. Uh, a, a Uh, add other degrees uh, on top of their 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 uh, art degrees, uh, and I think that's also a way of making of uh, of uh, investing in creativity and and letting it out in society. There's ample space out there to yes. use creativity. Mm, mm, yeah, but let's uh, let's talk about SMK. Yes, and I think the first thing <laughs> my my question <laughs> is when you get that phone call and they say, "Guess what? You are now going to be the director of SMK." Are you terrified or are you elated? Uh, what happens? <laughs> no, I wasn't terrified. Uh, I, of course, it always comes as a, as a surprise, but uh, but at the end of the day, it was my own choice, not my own choice, uh, uh, because someone uh, had to uh, to accept it. But I submitted my application. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a vacant position as uh, as a director. I submitted my application. I was through. Uh, uh, recruitment uh, process which is quite long it took several months I bet. Uh, interviews a lot of waiting time uh, uh, IQ tests and uh, things like that uh, psychological tests wow. uh, all things you can imagine it's it's all there and um, uh, but but uh, but finally when the, when they called and offered me the job uh, I was of course surprised Uh, and uh, and uh, extremely happy, of course, mm. uh, because this is to me uh, the uh, uh, in a way the logical or the or the uh, uh, or the best next step I could imagine. Mm. Uh, I have been uh, working as an art historian in different capacities, both in research as as a manager for uh, at that point. This is one and a half years ago. Uh, for almost 20 years, and I felt that uh, that the combination of a Broad art historical, professional, and research based foundation combined with uh, with substantial leadership experience uh, made me quite fit for that position. It makes a lot of sense, mm. and also it's important that you understand what the job that people are doing at the institution what yes. that is. Yes, you know, because a just just administrator might come in and not really understand what research art mm. history research mm. is about or you know even conservation or you know whatever the many things you guys do yes uh i am of course as as a director you are also an administrator but uh but i in my institution just as in the uh, academy of fine arts uh i i have and i had a head of administration who takes care who can you know count the money and uh Um, make the annual accounts and and uh, and help me getting the budgets right and so on. So so the decisions I make are based on on a firm financial uh, platform. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, but but I am an art historian. I consider myself as a as a working art historian, uh, uh, using my whole knowledge uh, and my also my uh, my passion as. Uh, As an art professional uh, uh, in a leadership capacity, yeah. Um, so, um, so I couldn't imagine. I c actually, I couldn't imagine the museum, uh, the SMK, being managed by a purely administrative management. Uh, an administrator is uh, is um, uh, is something you can't uh, be without. Uh, but but the uh, but the top management has to be. Uh, a kind of um, not necessarily an active researcher and uh, because an active researcher would probably be a quite frustrated uh, or at least an ambitious I would say an ambitious researcher uh, in uh, in a in a director's position as uh, public institutions have developed would be yeah. a quite frustrated one so what I uh, I consider myself as an active art historian uh, primarily working as a director of a museum but uh, but Uh, as a director, I consider part of my job to be uh, an art historian working, writing uh, about uh, uh, whatever uh, I, I love to write about. And so, you can find the time to do that? Uh, especially if, uh, I, if, I, um, if I, I do that work in my weekends and, and summer holidays and things like that. Yeah. Uh, during normal office hours, it's, it's not possible to, uh, to sit there writing and uh, reading books and so on. 
it's uh, there are too many meetings, too much um, strategic work, mm-hmm. um, too many relations to develop, too much fundraising uh, to be done. Uh, but uh, I enjoy sitting almost every every evening, uh, writing an essay, doing a book, preparing an exhibition. Uh, uh, of course, not to the same extent as I would have been doing had I been a university professor or a, a curator uh, in my own museum. Yeah. But the combination, I think, is wonderful. And without doing of course, I have from time to time considered dropping that part and just saying, well... Uh, let's face it, you're a director, you're an ad- administrator, uh, forget about being an active uh, um, researching and writing art historian, but I just can't do it. And even though I, uh, I uh, sometimes in the middle of, a, of a, the process of writing an essay, uh, feel like leaving it there uh, and uh, going back to what is, what is actually uh, more easy, just being in my office and doing the administrative work. Right. When I finalize it, I have I get such a kick, and uh, and I feel that uh, that this is uh, worth uh, you know every uh, every part of it, and uh, and I um, I'm quite convinced uh, today that that having uh, kept on ins- uh, having insisted on uh, writing and from time to time also doing uh, doing research work is what makes me. Uh, the uh, the leader or the yeah the director I, I am mm-hmm. that is one with with a with a quite uh, I should say uh, quite um, with with a with a passion for arts intact and and with a with a, a broad knowledge I'm, right. I'm uh, maybe not the expert knowledge that I would have had uh, if I had been in a in a more specialized position as, as an art historian but with a broad knowledge. Yes, that was Mikkel Bo, and I think that's a really interesting timeline there, which goes through. So next week, the conversation continues. Tune in next Wednesday. I've been out of town, so I do not know what's going on out there in the art world. I know David Risley has a show. Lots of great people have a show. We are back and running out there. So just tune in next week. We'll take it from there. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Undergang Armchair. The intro and outro music was kindly provided by Johnny Ripper, and today's interstitial was provided by Arcee. You can find links to their music and tons of other conversations with great people at our Art Institute administrator of a website, undergang.net. This show is produced in part with the kind support of the Danish Arts Council. Thank you for joining us, and as always, tell a friend about this show. In 2016, we would love that, and we will catch you guys next week.